Hello, welcome to the first episode of the Curious on Earth podcast. I'm Hendro Soinumma. I'm a musician, a writer, podcaster, and amateur generalist from Finland. I've been running a podcast in Finnish called Ihmisia uh, Elamia for a couple of years now. I think I've now done 54 episodes. And for a while now, I've I've been thinking about starting a new podcast in English because there's a lot of people in the non-Finnish speaking wor- world that I really uh, would like to have conversation with. So so here is my first episode of this podcast with a professor of geosciences, Marcia Bjornerud, whom I really enjoyed having a conversation with. Mm. Marcia's book, Timefulness, and in general, her thinking around that concept of timefulness has been really inspiring for me. Uh, Timefulness as a concept can be maybe contrasted to mindfulness, where the focus is on the current moment, focusing on what's here right now, whereas timefulness shifts the emphasis from the current moment to, to long, long, long periods of time, hundreds of thousands, millions, even billions of years. In the geological thinking, and uh, Marcia is talking about what the style of geological thinking can bring to our understanding of the world and our place in it, both as individuals and, and also as a species. And... Uh, If you enjoyed this discussion, uh, you can follow my podcast on Facebook, Instagram, on Twitter. You can subscribe uh, in YouTube or SoundCloud, uh, iTunes, Spotify, all the usual suspects of the podcasting world. And uh, also, if you want to support um, this podcast, uh, you can check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash curious on earth. I already have a, a different separate Patreon for my Finnish audience, uh, but this is a new one that's going to be in English. So if you want to follow up uh, more in depth uh, what I'm doing and engage with me in this project, uh, please consider uh, a Patreon subscription. And uh, Yeah, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Marcia Pionerud. Okay, so uh, welcome to the first episode of the Curious on Earth podcast. Um, professor professor of Geosciences and Env- Environmental Studies, Marcia Björnerud from Lawrence University. Uh, I'm very grateful for you uh, being my first guest on this podcast that I've been uh, thinking for a long time already of starting. So I'm really grateful that you're doing this with me. Well, and I'm very honored to be the first Earthling chosen. <laughs> hmm. So I'll start uh, with uh, just a, a brief back- background Uh, for the viewers on how I became interested in your work. So I was just uh, on a hike in Lapland in Finland with my wife uh, last month. And as we were driving back from there to Helsinki, the capital of uh, Finland, um, we had a long drive, took like 16 hours or something. And during the drive, uh, we talked about listening to some podcast and uh, she proposed uh, your podcast appearance in the For the Wild podcast, which she had already listened to before. And uh, and we listened to that, and that was like really profoundly eye-opening. Uh, I feel like after getting in touch with your work, I've been looking at rocks uh, in a different way. Not not that much that I I feel that I know a lot more about rocks, but I am looking at them in a in a different way, uh, like being open to learning from them and listening to them uh, in a way that I hope will get clear. Uh, for listeners as we proceed with this with this session so my my first question is qu- quite in the deep end directly so what is the earth hmm. oh. <laughs> the earth is a rock but i would venture to say 
it's in some sense, maybe not a very strict biological sense, alive. It has invented itself and reinvented itself again and again over the last four and a half billion years. It has a biography that it almost seems to want to share with us. Um, and it's an amazing life story. So I've been in the field of, of geology, geoscience for two thirds of my life at this point, came into it as someone who didn't even think of myself as a science person, had to learn to think like a scientist, um, didn't allow myself a personal connection with what I was studying until maybe a decade or so ago. And I've come around to seeing this thing that I've been studying from a scientific perspective in a very personal way. So I guess <laughs> to answer your question, I, I think we don't understand what the earth is at all scientifically. We're only able to get whiffs of of what it is and what it means. And I'm like many geoscientists realizing how immensely mysterious it is. Um, and in some broad sense, a living being. And we can talk more about why that's so controversial to say. I, I probably would not say that at a scientific conference, but I think many earth scientists in some part of their minds actually think that. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a rock. very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll ask more about the controversy viewpoint in a bit, but also as an maybe an introductory question, what exactly is geology and what what isn't geology also? Right. So I, as we were talking before we went online here, um, my, my department recently changed its name from geology to geoscience. <laughs> and I was a little bit um, uncomfortable with that. I felt there's, there's nothing wrong with geology. But I think in many people's minds, geology is backward looking. It's about the past, about a past that for most people feels irrelevant. Geoscience emphasizes the idea that we, too, live on Earth, in geologic time. And so geoscience is a little bit more embracing. It's, it's how the Earth works today, how the future might unfold, and it doesn't smack of that old, musty reputation that geology has. But I, I would say geology and geoscience are you know, really <laughs> doing the same thing. It's, it's a branding thing. Um, you know, as far as the limits of what the geosciences are, it certainly is centered on the Earth. The name geo is Earth in Greek. But... Um, it includes more and more an understanding of our neighbors in space, the other terrestrial planets, Venus, Mercury, and Mars, um, and their satellites, <laughs> our moon, the rocky moons of Jupiter even, are becoming kind of part of this larger geoscience um, because they're foils for us. They help us understand their siblings in space, how, how Earth um, began from some of the same ingredients, but then evolved differently. So the scope of the geosciences is quite broad and, and overlaps with, with astrophysics, chemistry, physics, biology in, in messy ways, as it should. <laughs> I think geoscientists are, are among the most broadly trained scientists because we have to have some um, fluency in the language of all these other adjacent sciences. It's a very hybrid science. It, it makes no pretense to being pure. It's, it's very applied and, and very um, interdisciplinary. Would you elaborate a bit on the pureness? Right. So at least in English, I'm not sure if this is true in other languages, we have this interesting distinction between pure and applied science, as if the opposite of pure which would be impure, is anything that actually has a practical application. Um, and so physics and chemistry can have a branch that is, is really sort of almost in a platonic sense floating above reality. It, it, you know, the, the, the idea of the atom or of laws of nature that transcend any actual um, instance of them is, is interesting. It goes right back to the Greeks. When, when we do geology, we, we really 
we're always talking about something that is grounded in the real, the the literal dirt, the earth. <laughs> and so um, I think that's one of several reasons that the geosciences have never had the prestige of say physics or chemistry you know if, if there's a hierarchy certainly physics is at the apex and then maybe chemistry and then biology and then the earth sciences are sort of at the base and i think part of that is this still ancient greek idea that the things that are of the earth are in some ways lesser they're literally mundane <laughs> um and and less lofty less um less divine, frankly, than, than these theoretical realms. And that's a wrong-headed kind of idea. We, most of us will spend our entire lives here on the earth and um, getting to know how it works is arguably an urgent hum, human priority. So in your work, uh, your latest book is a book called Timefulness. And in the book and in your work generally, you talk about the importance of, of geology and perhaps earth sciences in general uh, for understanding the place of humans in this world, the necessity of thinking like a geologist in order to understand where we come from, where we're going, how we are actually situated on this planet. So would you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, so geologists cannot really forget about time. It's it's another spatial, almost spatial axis in which we work. Anytime we look at a landscape or rocks, we need to situate ourselves not only geographically, um, but also in time <laughs> to understand the, the temporal context of, of when something happened. So we swim in time all the time. And for me and most geoscientists, I think we have a good sense of the geography of time. I, I, I feel often when I go um, into the fields here in northern Wisconsin and I, I start looking at rocks, I'm, I'm entering a portal into the, the age of those rocks. They're saying, here is the world that we knew. And um, that very tangible sense is something that deeply enriches my experience of, of living on Earth in our time. I see um, the, the many layers of the past that are in some sense still with us. And, and to me, that, that is an experience of being alive that I, I really value. And I think many other people could share it. But there's also just the practical part of geology. The geosciences, geology are very interesting in that there's this very pragmatic side and then there's a kind of philosophical side and we're constantly kind of moving between them. Geology, of course, has been implicated with some of the worst um, environmental crimes of the past century and a half, oil and gas extraction, coal, mineral exploitation. But as I said, it also has this deep, almost spiritual side that comes from understanding the antiquity of the earth, the continuity of life over time, those things are deeply um, existentially moving, <laughs> I think, once you begin to be receptive to them. And I think that a lack of a sense of connection to the earth and to our evolutionary past could be argued to be at the root of many the spiritual malaise that we are experiencing perhaps as a modern society. That's kind of a bold statement, but I do think that um, the illusion that we are separate from nature, that nature and its powers are irrelevant to our daily lives is part of the reason we all feel so sad and disconnected and um, fearful. Yeah, it's really like the questions of the question of how do we fit in on this planet and how to live life in a way that has at least the potential of 
like multi-generational sustainability is, is among the most interesting questions I find in, in life and, and really reading reading your book and also listening to your lectures has opened up a new avenue of thinking for me because geology is not something that I've thought about a lot and, and as, as I was reading your book I started I, I was trying to remember like what I remember uh, or, or what I can recall from from the days of uh, in school like geography uh, the like the when I was a kid and learned about geography and maybe a, a bit about geology also um, I think it didn't contextualize for me in a sense and I, I think I had that problem in general in school that that it was difficult for me to understand how all the different fields actually connect and contextualize with each other and uh, only like as year, years have passed I've started like understanding how the dif different fields fit together and i think it's quite common for people not to feel a connection for i think it's, it's naturally challenging for us to think about uh, life or the world in, in really long time scales I, I imagine it takes quite a bit of getting used to and and also i i cannot even imagine how different it, it is for you than for me for example to to look at natural formations in the world. Yeah, let me, I, I absolutely agree that it's, it's common that people have not been exposed to the, the logic of geology or the way that geologists think. And it's, at least in this country, it's just an artifact of when public school curricula became established and the evolution of the science itself. Geology has been around for, you know, since people began trying to extract metals or even before making stone artifacts, I suppose. But the modern science of geology is very young. I mean, it's shocking to me to reflect that when I was um, starting school, plate tectonics was still not even recognized. You know, this is in my own lifetime, we have <laughs> begun to understand how the solid earth works. And so by the time um, school curricula became established, at least in this country, maybe in the 1920s, um, physics and chemistry were well-established, rigorous sciences. The geosciences were still largely about just taxonomy and identifying rocks and minerals. And so um, just were not incorporated into, into the curriculum. And that, that unfortunately has continued, even as the geosciences now, I would argue, are in a kind of golden age. We have the conceptual framework as well as the computational capacity and the analytical machines that can <laughs> do all kinds of um, very high precision measurements that have opened up the, the world to us. And that has not percolated down to the average person living on the earth. And that is a real tragedy. And that's why I, I have turned more of my time to writing for the public, writing for earthlings, <laughs> um, to, to open our all, all of our eyes to how remarkable this place is and how we need to learn to live within its rules. Um, and then in response to your comment about thinking on long time scales, it's, it's definitely something that takes practice and returning again and again to kind of this idea of the narrative of the earth. I think geo geoscientists have been at fault in part for people's aversion to thinking in long times. We, we, we flog people over the head with how old the earth is, how long ago things happened. And that's not very interesting. What's interesting are the stories that unfolded in those immensely long periods of time. Then we can bring people in. Here are the protagonists. Here are the earlier earthlings that were living and dying on this same place. It was a long time ago and yet, in some way, in their stories, we can recognize similarities. We can find empathy. <laughs> um, and so I think it's not just the, the long periods of time. It's filling in those long periods of time with, with narrative. Um, and in my book, I mentioned two names or words for time that the 
the Greeks used. One is chronos. That's the one that most people would know, like chronology. And that just is the measure of time, the raw numbers. And then there's kairos. That is time within a narrative. And that's really the kind of time we as humans experience, our own, the story of our own lives. And I think that is the way to engage with the earth, to begin with the rocks and the landscapes in your own backyard, <laughs> whose contours are familiar to you, and begin to be able to read them. And then that becomes a framework for a larger understanding of their place in the, in the planetary scale story. And then you start understanding what a billion years means. It took this much time for those stones to become what they are. It took that much time for that landscape to be shaped. And then you, you get a sense for the, the relative rates of these processes. Um, so not just the numbers, but the, the, the agents that happened, <laughs> the, the, the phenomena that happened and how long it took for them to unfold. Then you can start feeling earth time in a, an almost intuitive way. Yeah, a billion years is something that's really difficult to get any kind of a grasp on. I actually thought maybe you could give an example of uh, example or two of things on this planet that took or that have been ha happening over the course of a billion years, just so uh, both I and our listeners could get a grasp of what is a billion okay, years in so, geological time. Yeah, so the Earth is... 4.5 billion years old. So a billion years, one billion years would be a quarter, a little bit more than a quarter of the age of the earth. So that's, a, it's a long time span. Um, a billion years ago, some of the rocks that are right in my area were, were formed in a great rifting event um, that spewed huge amounts of the volcanic rock basalt, like forms in Iceland today. Um, and nearly ripped the continent of North America apart. Uh, for some reason that stopped. North America remained intact and <laughs> all we're left with is a pile of old volcanic rocks. So a billion years ago, the tectonic setting of this place was, was very, very different. Um, in Finland, most of your rocks are actually even a little bit older than that. They're right around two to 1.5 billion years old. So um, they're, half again as old as that. <laughs> um, and so a billion years is a kind of time scale where entire um, continent, supercontinent cycles can, can come and go. It takes around 500 million years for an ocean to open through the process of seafloor spreading and then close again and continents to collide um, through the process of subduction. That's, that's a cycle that we can see has happened again and again. People might have heard of the supercontinent Pangaea. That was the most recent supercontinent. It, it came to its sort of largest size around 250 million years ago. And since then, it's basically been in the process of, of splitting apart. The modern ocean basins have opened. In another 200 or 250 million years, we'll probably have a new supercontinent where all the, the, continental masses are assembled again. Um, and so that, that kind of time scale, 500 million years is about the time of supercontinent creation and destruction. So a billion years would be maybe two supercontinent cycles like that. So it's a long time. It's enough time for the, the full geography of the earth to be reshuffled um, completely. <laughs> it feels really difficult to even start to try to grasp the meaning of a billion years because if there's no one who's actually like measuring time experiencing that okay you can talk about the revolutions of the planet around the sun and 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 there are different perspectives to get sort of this objective objective grasp on it but to really like on a experiential level it's just uh, astonishing to even think about also, uh, yeah. I guess another way to think about it is that uh, the the average rate of plate motion is a is centimeters per year. So that's about how fast, if one cared to measure, your fingernails grow. <laughs> so it's slow, 
but it's not imperceptibly slow. We can tell that our fingernails do grow. It's boring to watch them on an hourly basis, but over the course of a week, you can tell they grew. So that is the kind of time or the rate we're thinking of when we're talking about these tectonic processes. And again, it's we can understand them. They're just a little bit more patient and deliberate than we are. Hmm. Also, like one framing that I've had, because you mentioned before, like regarding how to live on this planet in a sensible way. And uh, so I've been thinking quite a bit about oil, uh, fossil fuels in general, but oil especially. And I think the impact that oil, like discovering uh, the modern uses of oil, the impact that it's had on our society is also like really, really difficult to grasp, I think, like thinking in the sense of philosopher Timothy Morton's term hyper object, I think oil is a sort of hyper object in the sense that it's impossible to grasp all its like uh, strands that's, that are affecting our society simultaneously. And we had no way of uh, realizing it beforehand, like the kind of impact that it would be having on our society. And it's like affecting everything in our modern society. And the and perspective of compassion that I've found uh, for us humans, even though in many senses it feels like we're majorly fucking things up on this planet, but still like uh, the fact that we didn't have any sort of like manual for how to live sustainably on this planet, especially after finding these like uh, energy reserves that have taken millions of years uh, to to form, uh, like there's no one to to guide us like no elder who who would have taught us how to how to really like form a responsible relationship with oil and also even though of course there have been like some people who have grasped quite early on the kind of effect that 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 sort of uh, almost at least for a moment limitless energy for us has had but like how to actually make enough of the whole human civilization to wake up to the to, to the actual effect of oil on our society is really difficult like how to create the kind of political transformation that we need in order to uh, to to shape our society in a way that's compatible with long-term survival is just really really difficult and that's yeah that gives me uh compassion and forgiveness for us because without that kind of perspective just you know thinking from the point of view of how selfish we are and stuff like that but it's really change change in general is really difficult updating your worldview or or your sort of like operating system is really challenging it is it's terrifying and i agree absolutely with you that we need some way to find hope and solace. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so many things you said. The, the, our, our culture, Western culture in particular, has valued cleverness over wisdom is, is something that I've, I've long thought, that we, we think we're so smart, but we're not wise. We don't have the capacity to anticipate the unintended consequences of things like the discovery of cheap fossil fuels. It has, yeah, hydra-like insinuated itself into all aspects of society. And um, it, I think it's, it's a sad truth that the unintended consequences of our technologies will almost always outlive the intended ones, <laughs> the good things that, that were brought about by fossil fuels are probably in the long term going to be overshadowed by their long-term negative consequences. So we are still in, in the time when we're mostly enjoying their advantages, but there is a long shadow they will cast into the future that other generations will live with. Um, and I think the rates of technological advance, our cleverness is, is almost limitless, but those capa the capacity for inventing new technologies the rate of that greatly outstrips not only natural processes like the carbon cycle and whatever, but our own rate of becoming more mature, 
I think we're still in the adolescence of human culture where we are always too eager to think we can break the rules and haven't come to a more mature understanding of our place on earth saying it only hurts us if we're always defying mother nature. Um, in the end, breaking the rules is going to be our, our downfall. So rather than trying to trick nature, let's learn about nature. Let's understand the work of billions of years, um, revere that, and, and perhaps learn some, some really powerful design principles even from it. But that, that requires a cultural change. It requires decapitalizing <laughs> the minds of many people who have been convinced that um, human inventions are cleverer and wiser than, than natural ones. And it's, it's a major project. Um, but I, I believe maybe naively that exposing people to the truth about the deep mysteries of the earth is, is one way to start this cultural shift in perspective that we, we need. I don't know if that's true. Most days I hope it's true. I, that's why I'm in the business of education. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. I think also like uh, a tiny bit more regarding oil because it's so impactful, but I think is we tend to, when we start realizing the harmful effects that fossil fuels are having on our society, we tend to think about oil as sort of dirty. And I think, because often, often, I think many people have a sort of drive towards, or, or, or people f tend to think that we need to have more something called spiritual in our worldview. But I, I also think that uh, another way to frame it is that we need to get more material and more appreciative of the material stuff. And for example, uh, regarding oil, I think if we would more think about oil as actually something that we hold sacred, uh, that that would be something that would help us transform our relationship with it. Because when you think about what oil actually is, like what it's what it came from, it's astonishing, and it's the the like intensity of history that's included in oil is. Yeah, just amazing. I like that perspective of yeah, revering the thing, and then you have a different relationship with it. I think that that isn't yeah, that's a fresh new way of <laughs> looking at resources that are otherwise you know just kind of mercenaries for us. Instead, there's some kind of gift that yeah. Hmm. Could could I ask you a question about how how aware hmm. are Finns in general about the um the Onkolo nuclear waste hmm. repository project, the, um, is it Olkiluoto? Yeah. Olkiluoto, yeah. I, because yeah, I think I've... that's a wonderful example of long-term thinking. Um, there are people there mm -hmm. who are charged with <laughs> imagining Finland 10,000, maybe 100,000 years into the future um, and really have to understand that place in its past, present, and future states. Mm. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting like points of view that open up from thinking about nuclear depositories. And, and uh, yeah, I think in general, Finnish people are aware that that's happening in Finland, that there's such a project. And there's been like a couple of articles uh, regarding the, the the project and the problems. I know that you're um, you have like some sort of personal connection to it because you w wrote the foreword to the book by what? What's the name of this guy who did um, his doctoral Vincent thesis Elanti, on Ongolo? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Just for the listeners that uh, uh, I haven't yet read the the thesis, but I understand that it's about the sort of like uh, professional um, atmosphere surrounding the the the. Onkala project, but yeah, we don't have that many projects like that in our society that would really like require real long-term thinking. And even that's just like what a hundred thousand years or something. It's not like thinking about a hundred million years. But 
now you're thinking like a geologist. It's only a hundred thousand years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that book, um, the author Vincent Elenti from um, Cornell University took a kind of anthropological perspective on the people working on the project, just embedding himself as an ethnographer, almost studying what happens to people when they start thinking like this every single day when it's their job. Um, and I, I think he, he did a good, good job, but I, I didn't know whether this was a more broadly, if people more broadly were, were aware of this project and how visible it is, um, in general. Yeah. I think, uh, the, the thing may be the most, uh, most visible, uh, project regarding nuclear power in Finland is that our sort of late, latest nuclear project has taken a lot longer than it was supposed to, and it has been a lot more costly than it was supposed to. And uh, there's uh, a lot of discussion is about that, and then also the uh, ongoing uh, debate regarding like how much to to rely on nuclear power and whether to build more of it. Uh, but but yeah, there's. I think most pe people in Finland are at least aware that the Onkalo project is uh, of of its existence, sort of. Um, I'm noticing that uh, we have 25 minutes left, so I, uh, I'm thinking of what would be the questions that I would most like uh, you to elaborate on. But one uh, perspective that you set out in your book and in in your talks also. You talk talk about rocks as being not nouns but verbs. Maybe you could elaborate on that because I think it's a very good framing or a way to look at rocks. Yeah, and and that comes back to our earlier conversation about the public perception of the geosciences. I, I have to push back against this all the time. People just think it, that geology is about naming and classifying rocks that are sitting in display cases, inert, doing nothing at all. <laughs> And in fact, to geologists, rocks are, um, you know, records of processes. That's what I mean by a verb, that they, they are stories embedded in a dense um, cryptic text. And when you learn to read them, to continue that literary analogy, you know, they, they open up whole worlds. So they're, they're anything but inert. They have in some cases, violent, <laughs> dramatic stories to tell and their portals into to, to earlier times and places. So overcoming that idea that just rocks are um, and that rocks actually had to come into being and that they embody um, amazing tales is, is my point there. And I think everyone's lives would be enhanced if they had access to that. But again, in our educational systems, very few people have had even... Um, fundamentals of geology. And if, they, if they've had any, it's often not taught in a very enlightened way. Um, and I have to say many of my own courses in university weren't particularly inspiring. Sometimes I was like, I can't believe you just explained this amazing thing in this completely flat and disinterested way. <laughs> so um, I think there's a new generation of people in the geosciences who are, are doing a better job of, of communicating. So that's what I mean. Rocks are verbs. They are very vibrant entities that are trying to speak to us if we just have the patience to sit down and listen to them. I think in general, um, giving more space to thinking about phenomena in the world as processes is something that opens up uh, a lot of how the world is actually like. I think uh, one sort of effect of the scientific revolution was that we, for a couple of centuries, uh, thought more about objects and thought about, like in a reductive sense, details, which definitely has its place. And it's like opened up also astonishing avenues uh, to understanding uh, parts of the world, but I think we need to complement that with like process oriented and system oriented thinking. And also, for example, I think thinking about myself as a process instead of a noun is very helpful. And I think also 
it's related, for example, just to take one example from a very like practical uh, level of being human, I think mm, depression is related to uh, thinking about oneself in a, in a sense like an object that we think that we are a category or if we don't, uh, how do you say, like explicitly think that we are category but we still tend to behave as if there's like some stable identity and and when you start more thinking about yourself as a process as something that's changing and also like interchanging with the, with the environment and all the interactions that we have uh, we become maybe a bit more flexible because because one when it comes to for example depression one of the problems is that people tend to have a rigid static understanding of themselves and uh and it's really difficult to see like alternative ways of of understanding yourself or or seeing what kind of options are available for you and uh so i think a lot of our our challenges uh related to being human in this world are related to our our sort of like cultural grammar that we are inheriting from from uh, the past and i think instead of like replacing that cultural gr grammar i think that we just need to expand it to s the sort of like make in our toolkit uh, more available the language of processes and the pro uh, the language of like dynamic systems and and uh, for example that i think uh, of myself for example in relationship to my wife i think uh, from the perspective that we are sort of an emergent phenomena that there's no like uh, like true self that I can find, but it's more of a discovery that I find myself all the time as I create myself and also that we as a couple create each other like dynamically. And I think that sort of relationship also with the earth is something that we need to, to heal uh, many of the sort of ailments that uh, are cu currently expressing in our culture and, and in our way of life. Wow. <laughs> I, I think all of that is just so insightful. And um, I think the earth has all these metaphors and lessons embedded in it for us. If And yeah, I think your points about essentially respecting the power of time and respecting the processes of evolution is something we, we, we have to be deliberate about. We fear change, but we are change. <laughs> Every you know, passing moment we are changing and, and that is who we are, but we resist that. And I think I absolutely agree. There's so many psychological um, pathologies that emerge from fighting that all the time. And the treatment of natural objects, whether they're forests or rocks, the atmosphere, as passive entities rather than um, part of us or <laughs> connected to us are is at the heart of environmental ills um, and all kinds of again psychological problems. We we are it we have the illusion that we're in power when we think of these things as objects to be acted on and not as powerful entities that are parts of larger processes. So yeah, wow, there are many things you said that I'll, I need to unpack a little bit, but I think just shifting that grammar is a big part of it. Um, and, and will be a road to healing in so many ways, ranging from environmental to psychological. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> also like regarding thinking in broader time scales, this is more more still on the human scale. But one thing that I found really interesting that you've uh, mentioned is regarding the the map of the geological time scale, and because because also to take one other aspect of what you've been talking about in your work that we tend to uh, emphasize or we we sort of like shower glory towards the lone genius who figures out like that e e equals mc squared but 
the the process of the field of geology has much more been a slow process of like many 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 people cooperating and it's like slowly forming this map of the geological time scale but maybe you could elaborate a bit uh, for our listeners what that actually is and how it's like become uh, a reality the our understanding right, of so the, geology what kind of a process has yeah. it been so the geologic time scale i do think is one of the great intellectual achievements of humankind <laughs> the the fact that we can from our present plane of time um map in quite a lot of detail nearly the entire 4.5 billion year history of the earth is is astonishing but it's taken two centuries of people from all over the world of many cultural backgrounds nosing around tapping at rocks collecting fossils learning how to use the properties of radioactivity to date rocks <laughs> a very laborious process that i don't have time to go into but it's it's been pieced together little by little um starting really in the early 1800s and is this beautiful tapestry it's the biography of the planet and there are many parts that still need some details filled in but we have a pretty robust understanding that goes right back to the oldest rocks that don't date quite to the start of the earth they're 4 billion years old up in northwest canada and then we can fill in what happened before that looking to the moon and um a few pieces of mars that have fallen on the earth as meteorites but yeah the building of the geologic time scale i think is a beautiful human story of collaboration and competition of frustration and and epiphanies um and it i think that's more people should be aware of of how it came to be i in this country we have people um religious fundamentalists who cling to the idea that the earth is only 6000 years old and has was sort of created as it looks today um and to me that's that's a it's a tragic sort of cartoon version of the reality of this immensely long story it just makes me sad that the people are so unreceptive to the antiquity of the earth and the beauty and the complexity of the the real story um so yeah the geologic time scale is is a beautiful tapestry <laughs> it's really mind boggling to think about that i don't know how uh how long have we ha- have we had like just um a rough map of map of the whole world like in ge- like general like not in all the detail of today but just the the geography of the earth yeah yeah just oh, just yeah. just a regular just map. i mean i think since the 1600s yeah or so 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 to yeah. think about to think about like okay at that point we had the map and we lacked the whole like sort of like depth uh dimension of that that we don't didn't have much of uh the understanding of where exa- it exactly came from and it's really like weird to try to try to think about like what it would have been during that time to think about the world how you would perceive the map because i think nowadays even though like uh, as you keep pointing out in your world that our sort of uh, level of education in in geology is is lacking but still like there's most people know at least something about this sort of like deep time dimension but yeah to, to think about uh what people would actually see or or how they would think about the past 500 years ago or 400 years ago is really mind boggling uh there's so many questions that would be interesting to ask but uh maybe a bit more regarding time maybe actually uh, an impossible question uh maybe like uh, in the same uh gravitas as the first question i asked regarding what is the earth so what is time how do you think about time Ooh. Hmm. well I, I always feel a little irritated when I hear interviews with physicists who who want to assert that time is an illusion in some way that it, it's 
breaking the rules of symmetry that everything should actually be reversible because I see all around me when I casually look at a rock, the evidence of time. <laughs> I, I can't believe that time is, is illusory. But as I alluded to before, I think um, it's not just time, it's the power of time, it's the processes, it's the evolutionary pathways that give rise to complexity. So maybe that's what time is. It's the tendency for things to grow more and more complex, for more things to be thought of, for the earth to invent new minerals and new creatures. Um, that's, that's the arrow of time that we, we can see in the rock record. That I've come more and more, as I've taught the geosciences, um, trying to think of ways to engage people who might not come to the field naturally. Um, and I think one way of characterizing the earth is that it's creative. We look at, say, the moon or Mars. We know quite a bit about those bodies. We have moon rocks we can actually look at, and we have lots of information from Mars now. And what we see are worlds that um, are essentially frozen in time. There are very, uh, the moon especially is a very limited palette of minerals. There are about 300 different minerals that have been recognized in moon rocks. There are about 5,000 on Earth. And that reflects just all the, the actors on Earth, all of the um, ingredients in the atmosphere, all of the biological actors, that allow all of these recombinations. And so Earth over time has invented all of these things, which then continue to interact with each other in, in complex ways. And so I think that's what time is. It's, it's like what you were talking about is this, it's process, it's um, unfolding into new things that, that are connected, but, but do also diverge over time. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a very rigorous, it's, it's what can happen in time, not so much time itself. It's the, the opportunity that time provides that matters. Yeah, I think it's like uh, both are use, useful perspectives. The physicists view where I think when they say that time is an illusion, that if you think about what an illusion is, it's not necessarily saying that something doesn't exist but more that it's like something that's uh that appears as something but that that appearance might just be caused by a certain perspective so that, that's fair absolutely i mean and i understand their their framework in which they're asking this question but <laughs> for most of us yeah. who age and who see people we love mm. grow frail and and die, time is, is not illusory. It's a very real thing. So, but that's a this different... This is actually... Yeah. Hmm. This actually also connects, because um, uh, I'm listening to, to a lecture series by um, a Canadian cognitive scientist, John Verveke, who's uh, talking about in, in the series Untangling the World, not he's talking about the effect of Descartes on our sort of cultural grammar and and how like how the Cartesian dualism sort of came into existence uh, from the sort of conflict of the so you could reduce it in a sense to the physicalist account of the world which tends to be a perspectival or even anti-perspectival in a sense and then the sort of subjective being in the world sense and uh, it's really difficult to to uh form an argument that would uh, invalidate either of them that if you start from the axiom of the objective perspective sort of perspective or the subjective perspective both uh, give a very uh, profound view into the the quality of the world or how could you describe that so yeah i think it's very valuable to have both kinds of perspectives to to think about what, for example, regarding time, like what is time outside of the human or, or a conscious experience? Does it have a meaning there? And then what it is to experience time as an actual limited human being going through our very limited lifespan and also trying to make sense of it in the context of geological timescales. 
Yeah, and more broad, broadly, just setting up these dualisms, I think, is unhelpful. <laughs> if there's anything that geology teaches us is that most taxonomies we try to set up are, are flawed and, and will ultimately not help understand the natural phenomena. So, you know, that's a more general statement. But yeah, I agree. We need all perspectives. The The cosmos is so complex. There's not going to be any one lens through which the true view of it can be glimpsed. So yeah, we need diversity, intellectual mm. and spiritual diversity. Mm. Okay, I, I have a couple of questions regarding f the future before we start wrapping up. So maybe I'll start with the question of how would you describe your relationship with the future? Oof, boy, Henry. <laughs> well, I have a deep sense of optimism about the resilience of nature, that whatever we humans have done in, in these last couple of centuries are, are not in the long term really going to, to matter to nature. Um, but I, I, I try to feel optimistic from a human standpoint that we're, we're getting closer to um, the kind of cultural perspective we've been talking about of living living within nature it's it's hard to feel optimistic every day about that we sometimes seem to be making progress and then we slip back i'm fearful for the the coming generations i i, I think we are headed for a long and um a difficult time where the reality of our ignorance initially you know, it was just ignorance and now it's willful ignorance about the way the earth works is going to haunt us. And so I, you know, there will be more and more um, climate related challenges and we're going to be spending more and more of our resources cleaning up after hurricanes and, and rising sea levels and things like this. And there's going to be a time of, of readjustment, but I'm, I guess I'm, I'm hopeful that we human animals are resilient and, and intelligent enough to, to start um, changing our ways. I, I have three sons, they're all in their twenties and I'm not sure if I'll have grandchildren or not, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I can have this, these two ways of thinking the, the geological way, which sees these long-term things. And again, there, I feel like there's, I'm not worried. And then I can have the, the more proximal human perspective that includes my children and, and, and the coming generations. And I, I'm just doing whatever I can to, to help um, give people the tools that they need to, to shift the culture. So I don't know. I wish I could feel, say something more resoundingly optimistic, but yeah hmm yeah this also is, resonates with you you talk about polytemporality being able to perceive uh, different time scales sort of having in your toolbox the ability to to think in many scales of time and this is something that uh, maybe we can elaborate in a future discussion but uh, it feels really uh, feels like a very important concept Yeah, I think that's the habit that geologists have, that we can be driving down the highway and we see we're aware of our speed, <laughs> but we're also, some part of us is in the Proterozoic looking at the rocks and trying to understand what their story is. And it, it's, it's again, this habit of mind of, of seeing in four dimensions in a way. And that applies to the future as well, to, to be able to imagine here is this river now, it's going to want to go that way in the future. Um, let's not fight it. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, geologic thinking is not just retrospective; it's it's prospective. And what some of what we see is 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 not 
um, cause for optimism. Regarding the future, um, you've re referred to philosopher Samuel Scheffler's uh, idea of our sort of the role of yet unborn generations in our life and our sanity. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah. So his his idea is interesting. That you know, we think what what has the future ever done for us? Well, he argues that in fact knowing that there will be future generations is very important for our mental stability. Imagine if we knew we were the last generation and there's a PD James had a book about this that was made into a film that um, no more babies were being born. Children of men. That yes. Children of men. And it really changes your perspective. So even if you don't have your own children or grandchildren, um, knowing that there will be people that succeed us is incredibly important for our mental stability. And I think if, if more people realize that, that we have this tacit understanding that there will be people who follow us that, and that they are, in fact, keeping us sane, maybe that's a new perspective on the future that, that could help us care more. Um, there's a, the Finnish... Author Henry Tikkanen, is that how you would pronounce his name, has a quote mm -hmm. that I, I like very much. Yeah. Um, that is, because we don't think about future generations, they will never forget us. And, and so there's that mm. asymmetry of <laughs> care and responsibility. Um, and I think most world religions have that embedded in their in their ethos and if we could come back to that as a collective sense of shared values we could redirect ourselves hmm. this ties I in very well with your to, yeah sorry not wanting to think yeah. about the future is is again linked with your statements about not um, imagining ourselves as um processes we want to keep everything as it is we don't like to think about the future that won't include us but if we think of ourselves as a process, um, we can make peace with that future where we won't physically be present, but some part of us remains. And, and that's, that's a spiritual shift that has to happen um, and can't be kind of a, a science <laughs> initiated process. So there are limits to to the, the scientific perspective, but I think that the that, that science can work hand in hand with some of these cultural um, perspectives in a powerful way that maybe we haven't tapped into yet. Hmm. I think this, this all ties well into what you've talked about, uh, the idea of a secretary of the future that we would have in our political, uh, system uh, a bureau or or at least individuals that would have uh, as their sort of mission statement uh, like all the time bringing the long-term perspective maybe you could elaborate just a bit before we wrap up regarding that yeah and then that wasn't my idea it was kurt vonnegut the great novelist <laughs> mm -hmm. but i i think he's absolutely right and since i wrote the book in fact i learned that there are places that have such a ministry or department in fact um the the regional government in wales in the uk has a ministry of the future and that person sits at the highest level in the cabinet and any proposals that are made for example for new highways or or infrastructure projects need the approval of that person who is charged with taking the perspective at, of at least the next two generations, apparently. So um, if, if that could gain traction, that would be a, a very pragmatic way that every day people who are in positions of power are reminded, wait a second, what are the long-term consequences of that? That, that could be a way forward. Um, and we need to, to somehow think of doing comparable things in all aspects of society from from families to to companies to governments um international projects as well hmm. yeah i was thinking about like uh as a comparison to the idea of the secretary of the future that when you have a court case there's the 
uh, lawyer, there's the the prosecutor. The pros- prosecutor focuses on bringing up the prosecuting perspective, and that's their job. And they don't have to focus on anything else. They don't have to focus on defending. So, in the same sense, the secretary of the future might just they they wouldn't have to take into account all the other things because those probably are already get, getting taken into account. So, yeah, I think that's yeah. exactly right. That they're advocates for the unborn, the, those that are not present in the room. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have five short final questions that you can reply in like one sentence or longer if you want. This is uh, sort of a tradition that came from my, I've been, for the listeners, I've been doing a podcast in Finnish for, I think, 53 episodes, four years now. So I, I decided to bring my final questions from there to this podcast also. So the first one is, uh, could you describe an early memory that has affected the course of your life? Well, I do describe this in the book and it is a vivid early geologic memory of seeing films of the um, volcanic island Surtsey being born out of the Atlantic Ocean. It, it suggested to me that the earth was alive, that there was something deep within it that was waiting to be expressed. So, search say. Hmm. Uh, a thing that inspires you. Hmm. A thing or a person? Anything? Whichever. Yeah. Yeah. I my long departed great aunt Randi, who was born in Norway, um, who came across with her siblings and then um, when their parents died, became the, the, the mother essentially of a, a large group of children, never then had an opportunity to marry. She was considered too old to marry once <laughs> all the, the kids were grown up. And she lived um, by herself in a one room house in far northern Minnesota, gardened, canned, was incredibly self-sufficient and strong and robust um, till she went blind um, in her late 90s, but continued to to knit and <laughs> be just a productive and happy person. Um, she, I think of her and, and the resilience she had and the gifts she gave to everyone around her and yeah makes me happy even to Hmm. to mention her name Hmm. um something that brings out fear in you um american politics i'll say only that (laughs) if things go well where will he be in five year, uh, five years from now? This feels actually a bit weird because you're thinking in in the scale of a billion <laughs> billions of years, but still, <laughs> let's go. With where, it. where will I be, or where where will we be? Where will you be five years from now if things go well? Well, I, I have to put myself in the collective. If if things go well, five years from now we will be a long, a more enlightened path that maybe we'll be over this very tenuous, um, anxious time and we'll all be um, just a little bit more relaxed. And (laughs) so I'll put myself in with the collective. Let's, let's just hope we're, Mm. we're on a better path. And the final one, your greetings to the human race. This sort of already was a greeting to the human race, but... <laughs> yes. <laughs> My greetings to the human race. Um, hello, earthlings, you beautiful cre- creatures. Look down. Pay attention to the rocks. I think that's Good one. a message. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. This was awesome. Well, Henry, I I have a lot to think about, and um, thank you. Okay. I wish uh, that conversation moved moved things inside you. It definitely did for me. 
Mm. Yeah, there was uh, quite a bunch of questions that I really would have liked to ask, but uh, the time limits didn't permit to do that. It would have been awesome to awesome to talk a bit more about the concept of deep time uh, and uh, more about time in general. Also, uh, I would have liked to ask uh, regarding her, her thoughts on terraforming, the terraforming of other planets to, in order to make them uh, hospital, hospitable for human life. Uh, she has quite a critical take on that. Uh, also would have been interesting to ask about her thoughts regarding geoengineering as a response to, for example, climate change and other ecological problems that we find ourselves in the midst of. And also in the beginning of the conversation, I, I, I said that I would come back to the question of, because uh, she mentioned that her viewpoint on the Earth as a living being is quite controversial. It would have been in interesting to hear her elaborations on that. Uh, yeah, I think the, the most vocal proponent of, of the idea is James Lovelock, whose Gaia hypothesis basically states that the Earth is some sort of self-regulating uh, homeostatic system. And I know that Lovelock's viewpoint has gotten a lot of criticism, but also many people hold it in quite a high esteem, and it's an interesting way to look at the world. It, yeah, maybe it stretches the definitions that we most often use for life, but uh, but also being able to challenge our definition definitions of life is an interesting thing to do. But yeah, maybe I'll get a, another conversation with Marcia in the future. We'll see. One thing that I also like find myself thinking about during the preparation for this episode was because because the time we've been consciously reflecting uh, on our place in the world, uh, at least uh, according to our current understanding on consciousness. Mm. The time we've been doing that hasn't been that long. And I found myself thinking about like, what would a human civilization look like and be like and feel like where such conscious reflection would have gone on for, for a millennium or, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, a million years instead of just the possibly couple of thousand years it's been going on. Well, maybe a couple of dozen thousands of years, but still like uh, possibly not millions of years. I don't know what the other species have been doing here. Uh, and all, of course, I have no clue what the other species, uh, what's happening in their head right now, even. That's also a mystery for us, but... Yeah, it's, it's a question that I found myself pondering upon when doing the preparation. But yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for being with us in this session. Uh, the next episode will be with Emil Einer Fries, uh, who's known as uh, part of the uh, fictional uh, philosopher Hansi Freinacht, who's known for the School of Nordic Metamodernism whose thinking has been really influential for me for a couple of years already now. So Emil will be my, my next guest. I'm re really looking forward to that session. And uh, yeah, before you go, uh, just as a remind reminder, please subscribe this podcast to this podcast in uh, whichever media you enjoy having your podcasts in. And also, please, uh, if you enjoy this stuff, please consider following uh, the podcast in social media, in Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And also, if you want to uh, offer your uh, your financial support, you can also check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash curious on earth. Uh, I really appreciate any support that uh, you decide to throw in my way. So, yeah, thank you for spending this time with me and... Uh, Wishing you an inspired rest of your life. Ciao.